Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. Hello, Warbirders. So, in part one of this series, we saw the struggle for de Havilland to finally get their mosquito to the prototype phase. And in this episode, we're going to look at production. By early 1942, more contracts had been issued for almost 1,400 mosquitoes of various variants, including 20 trainers. Plans were made to build a mosquito in Canada and Australia. There were already existing subsidiaries of de Havilland in both countries, and in the end, several hundred were built down under, while de Havilland Canada built over 1,000. The rest were built in England by de Havilland and the Standard Motor Company, the Percival Aircraft Company, and Airspeed Aircraft. A total of 6,710 were built during the war, although 1,071 were produced post-war, which says something about the superb quality of the aircraft, that there was a continuing demand for them even after the guns had fallen silent. Unlike many versatile warbirds that were built to do one thing, and then other tasks were added gradually to their job description, the Mosquito was imagined right from the drawing board as an aircraft that would do several, very different, roles. Right from the get-go, it was planned that there would be different versions performing the roles of bomber, fighter, photo reconnaissance, and trainer. Let's look at the different types. The initial bomber version was to carry four 250-pound bombs, but the payload was increased to four 500-pound bombs. In order to fit them in the bomb bay, the tails of the 500-pounders needed to be cropped or shortened. In the spring of 1943, modifications were made to the bomb bay, including beefing up the suspension system and bulging the doors so that Mosquito bombers could carry a single 4,000-pound blockbuster bomb, which was also known as a cookie. It is pretty impressive that this bomber design, which could also act as a fighter and was made of wood, was capable of carrying this weapon while the Halifaxes and Sterling Heavies could not. Perhaps the most unusual weapon to be carried by the Mosquito Bomber was the Highball Bouncing Bomb. Highball was a bomb that looked like a fat tire, about waist high if you stood next to it, weighing 1,280 pounds. 600 pounds of this was Torpex, which was a special explosive designed for torpedoes hence the name Torpex. This explosive was 50% more powerful than regular explosive. Each mosquito was to carry two highballs, and these would be spun up by ram air pressure and then released 1,200 yards away from the side of a ship. The RAF tested hundreds of inert versions of these against old battleships in a lock in Scotland. Although the system worked, it was never used operationally unlike its bigger brother, which was known as Upkeep, which was dropped by Lancasters during the dam-busting raids. The fighter version of the Mossy wasn't meant to carry bombs, and the front half of the bomb bay was taken up by the four 20mm Hispano cannon. There were also four 303 machine guns installed in the nose, as well as a gun camera above them. In summer 1942, several raids were conducted on England by high-flying JU-88Ps. To counter this threat, a high-altitude version of the Mossy was created by putting a regular fighter version on a diet to lose 2,300 pounds in order to quickly claw its way up to intercept the high intruders. The cannon were removed, but the four standard 303 guns were retained. Some armor plating was removed, and as it was going to be used as a short-range interceptor, some fuel tanks and their fittings were also pulled out. Even smaller tires were used, and the control wheel was replaced by a fighter control stick. The wingspan was increased for high-altitude flight, and it could climb to 43,000 feet. From the very beginning, it was imagined that there would be a night-fighting Mossy, and almost 500 of these were built. They had radar sets, were painted with a special black paint, and had flame dampeners added to block the light of the Merlin's exhaust. Later on, some of these aircraft had their radar sets removed, 
and they changed from the defensive to the offensive line when they were used as night intruders. In June 1942, the Mark VI strike version was introduced, and why not? There was a fighter Mossy and a bomber Mossy, so why not have a fighter bomber Mossy? The Mark VI had a reinforced wing that could carry either one 250 or 500 pound bombs under each wing, or alternatively, up to eight rockets. Plumbing was also added so that a 50 or 100 gallon drop tank could be carried under each wing. The bomb bay was also split in two. Like the pure fighter version, the front area was taken up by the four cannon, but the rear was able to carry 250 or 500 pound bombs internally. Sticking to the insect theme, the Mosquito Fighter Bomber Mark 18 was known as a tsetse. The tsetse is an African fly with a serious bite, and the aircraft version had a serious bite also. The tsetse had its cannon removed and had a big Mullins 6-pounder Class M cannon installed instead. This was an auto-loading 57mm anti-tank gun fitted that could fire in a semi or fully automatic fashion. 25 rounds for the gun were carried. Two or four 303 Browning machine guns were kept in the nose, and although they could still do damage, they were mainly there to help sight the big gun onto the target. 900 pounds of extra armor was also added around the engine cowlings, nose, and under the cockpit floor. Why the big gun and the added protection? Because the tsetse was meant to prey on U-boats, which would fight it out on the surface if they couldn't dive. Now, if you thought that this had to be the biggest gun that a Mossy ever carried, well, you'd be wrong. Although it was only completed after the war and only tried on one experimental aircraft, a 96mm quick-firing 32-pounder, which had been designed for tanks, was installed. It was tried on one flight, worked fine, but then was retired. Hmm, so let's see what else we could do with this Swiss Army knife of an aircraft. What have we missed? Uh... Oh yeah, carrier operations. The Sea Mosquito had folding wings, an arrestor hook, thimble nose radome, and Merlin 25 engines with four bladed propellers. To handle the rough treatment of carrier landings, the gear had a stronger oleo pneumatic landing gear system rather than just the usual rubber compression shock absorbers. The Sea Mosquito was armed with the usual four 20mm cannon and carried two 500 pound bombs in the rear bomb bay. Under the wings, it could also haul a combination of two more 500 pounders or eight 60 pound rockets and a standard torpedo under the fuselage. Of course, there were unarmed trainers with dual controls and some were also configured as target tugs. There was even a configuration for carrying passengers and high value cargoes, but more on that later. During and after the war, Mossy served with too many countries to list without getting tedious, but some notable ones are Australia, Belgium, Canada, China, both on the Nationalist and People's Liberation Army, Czechoslovakia, France, Israel, Australia, New Zealand, Norway, South Africa, Sweden, Turkey, Yugoslavia, and even one made it to the Soviet Union. Operational History the first RAF unit to receive the Mossy was 105 Squadron RAF, which began using the new Wooden Wonder in November of 1941. In fact, I wonder how they initially felt about being equipped with an aircraft that was built by this older wooden technology and materials. I wonder if they were skeptical. Anyway, during 1942, they used it for hitting industrial and infrastructure targets in the Netherlands, Norway, France, and Germany, and pilots found that even if bounced by Luftwaffe fighters, they were able to use the Mossy's speed and wonderful handling qualities to evade. In September 1942, the squadron and its special airplane were selected for a notable raid on the Victoria Terrasse building in Oslo, Norway. The idea was to provide a morale booster to the people of Norway by tossing a few 500 pound bombs through the front door of the building which just happened to be the headquarters of the Gestapo in Norway. 
The four crews selected for the attack first flew their Mossies to an RAF base in Scotland, landed, and topped up their fuel for the long flight to and from Norway. They also bombed up with four 500-pound bombs each. The fuses were carefully set with a 11-second delay as the plan was to come in super low and they didn't want to be blown up by their own bombs. They then took off for what was planned to be almost five hours of flying. Flying at altitudes as low as 100 feet over the sea, they had hoped to avoid detection until it was too late. But it turns out that they were bounced by two FW-190s anyway. One Mossy was knocked out of the fight and performed a forced landing. Another one clipped a tree, they were indeed very low, and turned back. The last two Mossies dropped their bombs and four of them went through the front door and then through the back wall before exploding. The headquarters was not destroyed and there were quite a few Norwegian casualties. Even though the results of the raid were disappointing, mixed, it was decided to publicly reveal the Mosquito, which was done via reports on the BBC and the Times newspaper. Also in September 1942, Mosquitoes performed a low-level raid on Berlin, and speed was again used to outrun BF-109s. In that same month, a second squadron, 139, began trading their Bristol Blenheims for Mosquitoes. A few months later, in December 1942, Mosquitoes participated in a much more complex raid known as Operation Oyster. The target was the Philips factory complex in German-occupied Eindhoven in the Netherlands. This complex produced much electronic equipment such as components for radios and radar. The Brits wanted it knocked out. But the problem was that the factory complex was in the middle of Eindhoven and the Brits didn't want to kill and injure a whole bunch of Dutch citizens. A daylight raid by heavy bombers might be precise enough to hit the factories and not wipe out the town, but as this target would be beyond the range of escorting fighters, the potential losses from the Luftwaffe were deemed to be too great and so this idea was rejected. Hitting the factory at night was also rejected as this would cause too many civilian casualties. So a daylight raid using light and medium aircraft was picked as the best way to get the job done. It was a complex operation with many moving parts. Firstly, multiple different types of aircraft would be involved. There would be about 50 Lockheed Venturas, about 40 Douglas Bostons, also known as Havocs, a unit of B-25 Mitchells, and 10 Mosquitoes. These aircraft all had different speeds, but all had to arrive over the target within the same 10-minute time frame in order to try to overwhelm the defenses. Some of the aircraft had different routes, and some would stay low to draw away gunfire, while the rest would be a little higher at 1,500 feet before they dove in for the attack. This time, some of the bombs had shorter delay to prevent them from skidding away from the target area, although a few had 30 and 60 minute fuses to hamper the firefighting effort. The plan was that the first bombs to hit would be high explosives to blow open the buildings and expose them to the white phosphorus incendiaries that would be dropped after and would set fire to everything. All of this precise flying, including the low-level navigation and high-speed formation flying, was very demanding, and so before the big show, the B-25s were cut, as they just weren't performing well enough in the dress rehearsals. So the Bostons were to arrive over the target at precisely 12.30, with the Mossies arriving from the same direction, but only two minutes later. The Venturas would show up four minutes after that, from a different direction, and everyone would hedge hop home, again with different routes and at their own aircraft's maximum speeds. It boggles my mind that they could make all of this work. I find it hard to arrange a dinner and have everyone show up within half an hour of the reservations, let alone within individual minutes. Although not directly involved in the strike, there were also a formation of Spitfires to escort the bombers part of the way in, and USAAF B-24 and B-17 raids on Luftwaffe airfields to create diversionary confusion. Lastly, as a kind of icing on the cake, eight P-51s would go on a rhubarb mission, 
which was booting around and strafing whatever they could find to cause even more fog of war. After multiple training flights and several full-scale practices in November, the date of the raid was set for the 3rd of December. On the 2nd, the crews got their briefings and all the bases involved were locked down, with no one coming in or leaving and not even mail or phone calls being allowed. The next day, the raid was postponed for poor weather, as it was again for the next few days until finally it was time to go on Sunday, the 6th of December. At 9.30 a.m., the B-17s and B-24s were sent out on their diversionary raids, and they did attract the attention of the Luftwaffe, which shot one of them down. The main force aircraft, including our Mossies, took off between 11.15 and 11.30 and headed across the water, at 100 feet above the waves in complete radio silence. The Mosquitoes were to trail, two minutes behind the Bostons. This wasn't easy, as the Mosquitoes could be faster and had to resist the temptation to catch up with them. The first thing to cause damage to the attacking force was... Birds who struck several of the Bostons. Although they didn't bring down any aircraft, they struck and broke windscreens, some of them actually penetrating the cockpits and injuring aircrew. Others caused wing damage, and in one aircraft, the navigator's maps were sucked out the broken window, forcing him to navigate from memory for the rest of the mission. The Mossies escaped this fate, although they did have to deal with different birds. Butcher Bird FW-190s that rose up to chase them. Being unarmed, the Mossies only really had one option, and that was to run. Two of them did, and got away from the 190s. One was able to rejoin the raid, the other was not, and turned for home with bombs still on board. The Bostons arrived over the factory complex first, and dropped their bombs as planned between 12.30 and 12.33. The raid was basically time-stamped as the factory clock was damaged and stopped at 12.32. It was left just like that until the end of the war. The Mossies went in next, dropped their ordnance, and then turned to run amid the smoke and firing. The Venturas came in last and had it the hardest, as they had to go up against a fully alerted defense. On the way out... The Mossies caught up with their Boston brothers and initially joined the formation thinking that they would enjoy some protection from the other aircraft's guns. When the 190s arrived and started their attacks, the Mossy pilots changed their minds and basically said, the hell with this. Do you know what's better than being protected by machine guns? Not being attacked at all. The Mossy pilots pushed the balls of their throttles to the wall and got out of dodge. They only lost one of their number. Nine Venturas and four Bostons were also lost with a total air crew loss of 62. 31 aircraft had been hit by birds and some had hit tree branches too. But the Phillips plant had been severely damaged. Then the Dutch management and repair workers had to thread a fine needle by seeming to fix things quickly while really dragging their feet. The RAF helped by sending more Mossies back in March 1943 to bust things up again, and it took about six months in the end to get production back to what it was pre-raid. Next time on World of Warbirds, we wrap up this series with more of the Wooden Wonders' extensive operational history, including Operations Jericho, Arhus, and Carthage. Thanks again to all who support the podcast via PayPal at WOWB17. And if you haven't, please consider. I support the podcast that I listen to. If you like to watch as well as listen, check out the YouTube channel and you can purchase Warbird merch at the kit shop. You can also check out some photos of what we've been talking about today on the Facebook page. Until next time.